who simply accepted me for my hair suit nature. They would become my mentors, my elders, and they would spark a fire within me that would never be extinguished. I was not ready to, fu I was not ready to fully comprehend the idea of it, but many of these men, my friends, would tell me they were HIV, po HIV positive. Because of this, I would become an activist. Knowing these men and their struggle, knowing there was a problem in my community, I used my Jewish affinity for a community and struggle as a tool to overcome this disease and light the path for future generations. Soon I would find myself re researching safer sex practices, working with sexual education organizations and pleading with my peers to make healthy choices and to please play safe. With Jewish history and identity at my core, I was given the courage and insight to protect my people and fight for my community. By 21, when I found myself at San Diego Pride, when I passed that protester pleading me to come home to God, all I did was turn my head and ignore him. Who is he to say anything about my life, my beliefs, or me? How could he know how I personally feel about God? He couldn't. Nobody could. Because despite what anyone else may say, think, or believe, my relationship with God is my relationship with God, and how I choose to, be and how I choose to believe and communicate with God is up to me. I always knew going to Israel was a rite of passage. For my brand of East Coast Jew, it's just the next step in Jewish adulthood. You go to summer camp, maybe a teen tour, maybe a fish con concert or 50, and when you're done with college, you go on birthright. When talking with other Jews after graduating college, there are two questions. What was your major and have you gone on birthright yet? I was 26 when I went. I knew coming out on my trip wasn't going to be an issue. Most people don't know I'm gay until I out, I out myself, but I wasn't concerned about any reaction. I really don't care if people accept me or not, and in the end, I'm a hard guy to dislike. But I had faith in my fellow young Jews that this was going to be a non-issue. And it was. I came out to people, slowly but surely, mostly when people would ask if I was seeing anyone or had a girlfriend. And as I expected, I wasn't judged, criticized, or ostracized. It also turned out that I wasn't the only gay man on my trip. The only thing I was nervous about was how I would, how I would feel upon approaching the Kotel, the single event I had been simultaneously dreading and looking forward to. The Western Wall, in many ways, is, the, is an epicenter of Judaism, one of the few places in the world that is recognized by all Jews as a place to speak with God, a place to pray and ask for guidance. This was the ultimate test in a way. I wondered if at the Wall, among all the Orthodox, would I suddenly have a feeling of unworthiness? I found myself a little afraid, a little short on the confidence I used to carry myself through life. After all, I would be standing with God on his home turf. I gathered my thoughts, I recalled my life experiences, pulled upon my strengths, and looked into my heart. I wasn't unworthy, of course this wall was meant for me. It didn't matter how holy the land or how many Orthodox were going to be there, this was my wall as much as it was theirs. I'm Jewish too. The day before my group was to go to the Kotel, I was offered one final sign that would stand as, as my last spark of strength. I came out to my trip guide, Guy, with whom I had formed a quick friendship. His response was one that I'll never forget. An Israeli man, so knowledgeable and loving of his land, looked me in the eye and simply said, you should be very proud of yourself. Never lower your voice. At that moment, it all came together. This is how I'm Jewish. My voice, being an activist, taking care of my community. This is, this is all related to the Jewish identity. I was ready to face the wall. I was ready to bear myself to God in his house. I remember the day. It was bright with almost a white sun glaring down on the city of Jerusalem. The old city dazzled me with its sandstone streets and ancient housing built into rock. I turned the bend and the wall stood before me. There it was, huge, tall, exactly as I had seen it in, count, in books and countless illustrations. I saw the sea of Hasidism, dressed in black and white, and yet I was ready to walk past them and approach the wall. As I entered the lower level, I just kept walking, one foot in front of the other. I walked, slowly, absorbing the wall with every step. But the closer I got to the wall, the more my hesitation subsided. This place is mine. This is my homeland, too. When the wall was just a few yards away, I felt myself grow, pure and honest. I don't remember those last few steps, but suddenly I was caressing the wall, even trying to hug it. It is Jewish tradition that when at the wall, one is to write a note to God. People say if you were to remove all the notes from, from the cracks, the wall itself would crumble. I wrote a note to God that day, but I didn't ask him for anything. What could I ask from him? I was happy and healthy and loved the life he had given me. There isn't a single thing that I would change about who I am and how I feel about myself. Instead, I thanked him. I thanked him for everything, for this life, for my struggles, for my people, and giving me the opportunity to be the man I am with all I have and all that I have been given. 
Before I left, I kissed the wall and gave the stones one final caress, whispering, thanks for letting me come home. I want to thank all of our readers one more time, uh, collectively. Uh, Shoshana, Eric, Jake, and Morty for coming out tonight. Um, we still have a little bit of time if anyone has questions about the book, about Birthright, about any of the pieces you heard tonight. You can ask questions to me, any of the readers, if anyone has questions. Yes? Can you ask the readers a question collectively? Or? Sure. Um, what surprised you most about Israel? What, the question is, what surprised you most about Israel? I was surprised at how modern it was. You know, you have all these thoughts that it's so heavily religious, but really it's more secular than some parts of New York City. I was really looking forward to the falafel, but I was surprised to find it's actually better in New York. You just didn't go to the right place. <laughs> I, I was surprised, you know, if you stay there long enough, you get surprised at moments of normalcy. Because it's, it's a really cool place, you know. And then once in a while, it's like totally normal in America, like Morty was saying, you know, you hear music that's familiar or something. So that, 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 that was always like. Yeah, that's something else that surprised me that pop culture there is kind of on like a 10 year delay from the United States. <laughs> I think in the age of the area, it would be a little quicker, but apparently geography still matters. Any other questions? Who John? pays for birthright, and uh, how old? I mean, is there is there a point where you age out, or you can't really? There is go? a point where you age out. Right now, the the age limit is twenty six. Yeah, I know. We're just just a hair, hair too old. Um, and birthright is actually, without going into too much detail, birthright is. Uh, is a collection of dozens of different nonprofits that contribute to these trips, which is why, uh, if you heard, Eric went on with Israel Outdoors, I went on a trip with Shor Shim, Jake went with Aisha Torah, we all went with different organizations. So different organizations have different uh, itineraries, and they fund different buses, and they're all called quote-unquote birthright, but actually one bus might be quite different from another in terms of the itinerary and who goes. So one might be more religious, one might be more culturally based, one might be more outdoorsy. So there are, there are differences between the different organizations. And if you're like Spanish, Jewish, or? There are people from all, all, over, over, the all over the world. Um, almost all the birthright trips, um, not all, but almost all, come together for what they call a mega event in Jerusalem, where you'll have thousands of people who, are, who happen to be there at the same time, uh, each in their bus of 40, in a giant theater at once. And there's they're segregated by country, and I know one, the mega event when I was there, I don't know, there were 20 different languages going on, all flags hanging from, from all around the world. Yes? How many submissions did you get, or how many um, like pieces for the anthology did you get of people who came back feeling skeptical or feeling ambivalent about their relationship with Israel? I guess I'm asking particularly from a political point of view, but in other ways as well. The, um, there, there's sort of two ways to answer that. The submissions that I got from people who, who had, let's say, ambivalent or skeptical feelings about the trip are, are a minority but, but a, a definite presence, and there's some of them in the book. Mm -hmm. um, it was never anyone's intention to leave them out. In fact, I think it makes it more interesting to put them in. Uh, I mean, I think even some of the experiences you heard here tonight weren't mean quite so universally positive. There, there is a lot of mixed stuff going on. Um, I know there's one poem in particular in the book uh, by Jessica Young, who lives in Ann Arbor, who had written about what a good time she had on the trip and how it, how quickly it faded when she got home. Mm -hmm. About how, in retrospect, it didn't turn out the way she thought it would when she first got home. Um, and that was something I thought was interesting. I wanted to include is how how it feels not just the day you land back at JFK, but how it feels two years later, looking back, and how what you thought was happening maybe didn't happen. Would you prefer someone to read this before they go on birthright or after? <laughs> I prefer someone to read it anywhere. Um, I think, and, and well, maybe the, maybe the contributors could speak to this as well. Um, 
I know when, when you're on a bus with the same 40 people for 10 days, you sort of have an idea of what your shared experiences are, but none of the contributors in the book were on the same trip, often years apart and from different cities and different religious and cultural backgrounds and had different experiences. So I think if you've been on the trip, there's obviously a certain interest in seeing just how different everyone else's experiences were from yours. Um, but certainly, I think if you're, if you're a young Jewish person thinking about the trip, you, this is the stuff that's not in a brochure. Um, the things you know, the things you know about a birthright trip before you go are actually quite limited. I mean, you get you get a brochure, and that's it. It's a pamphlet. That's it. And you know the very basic outlines of your itinerary. But I think, and again, contributors jump in if you disagree. I think the itinerary is actually one of the less important things you bring back from the trip. It's kind of like, you can tell me what classes you took in college, but that's not really what your college experience was. Um, much of what happens in today's is what happens on the bus, what happens in your hotel, the people you meet, um, the people you fall in love with, the friendships that you end, the different directions your religious identity goes, one way or the other. I think a lot of that is not about what you read in the pamphlet before you go. I mean, do you guys have... I, I wasn't. I, I thought it was going to be a ten-day tour guide-based trip. I didn't ex expect to have such a spiritual, personal connection to uh, to the trip, to the people on the bus, as well as Israel as a whole. I think um, the trip that I was on, Asia Torah, and uh, I think they really wanted to like wow you, and, and so from their perspective. I think the less you, you knew in advance, the better. So like, you know, you get out there, you walk out of the bus, and oh my god, you know, like they, they really that it's that kind of an organization. You know, which um, if you're into that, then you know, get the board. If you're less into it, you could, could be skeptical about it. But that's that was their approach. I know before I went, I've been working uh, on on a couple of projects with Birthright for the past couple of years, and when I first started working on this book. Uh, I also worked on a guidebook for them, for Tech Leap Threat Israel. And I've been to Israel several times before, and before I went, they said, uh, before I was working on the guidebook, they said, well, we'll just send you um, a list of places that we go so you can write a guidebook about it. And I said, that's actually the least important thing. I, I need to actually go on a bus um, with people who are much younger than I am. <laughs> but I need to be on that bus. There's no other way to get it. Um, you can't get it from reading the list of places you visit. I've been to Masada before, I've been to the Wall before, um, Yad Vashem, I've been to all these places. Uh, and even if I'd gone on my own and followed their same itinerary for 10 days, I would have missed 90% of what there was to get uh, out of being on that bus. So, and I think it's really, that's, that's where the bulk of the experience is. And you, and you can't predict that in advance. You don't know who's going to be on your bus. Yes? Um, I guess I'm wondering why um, vitamin-fed Americans have a birthright to go to Israel when people in the West Bank and Gaza who have direct ancestry do not have this birthright. Probably the same reason why Jews aren't allowed in their areas. That's not a good answer. Well. That's distant. That's sophistry. <laughs> Because it doesn't take into account complexities. I didn't know the nature of the evening was political. Or... I'm asking a question. So, I feel that the term birthright is inculcating a sense of entitlement in Americans that perhaps is injudicious. It's actually a different word in Hebrew. In Israel, they call it discovery. So I think we just pointed out that wasn't specific to Americans, like two minutes that's ago. That's true. It is, it is global. That's true. Two minutes ago, that was addressed. 